Hi. Hi. Welcome to Why Are We Like This, a Heart Stopper podcast. I'm Ashley, she, her. And I'm Alyssa, she, they. And today we are here to talk about season two, episode three, Promise. Yeah, yeah. we did it. We made it to the recording. <laughs> we did. I'm sorry, everybody. I am sick. <laughs> and... The day that we were supposed to record this, I woke up without a voice. Uh, and so I texted Ashley and I was like, hey, so my voice currently doesn't work. I will keep you updated on if it returns, but we should come up with a plan B. <laughs> I mean, to be fair, that was our rescheduled date. The yeah. first date, I had something happen. And so it got rescheduled a couple of times. Yes. But we're here. We're here, we're queer, we're a little unhinged. (laughs) (laughs) So before we dive into this episode, I had a couple of notes to follow up on. Okay. One, we totally missed that the teacher and family that is talking with Ben and his parents is the intimacy coordinator, David Thackeray. Oh, I didn't know that. That's awesome. That's super cool. Yeah, I love that. Also, just really quick, since we're talking about him, I would just like to congratulate David Thackeray on an excellent job of doing his job this season. Uh Uh-huh. We're going to talk about it in Paris, but, Mm -hmm. like, that man did his job very good. Uh (laughs) Uh-huh. The other thing we missed is that we caught Nick's donut on the shelf, but Charlie also has one in his room. On his like dresser that's beside the door, and we can see it in like the makeout montage and stuff. And so, like, totally missed that one, but caught Nick. So they each have one, and so that double makes me want to know the story. I was gonna say, so are we choosing to believe that they each won each other one, or one of them worked really, really hard to win two? Well, we saw how good Nick was at it. I feel like Charlie showed up and was just like, bam. Oh, that was easy. (laughs) Bam. Now we both have one. (laughs) Is there the secret third option that one of them went on, like, Amazon or something and ordered (laughs) some donut plushies? (laughs) You know what? That is a Nick Nelson thing to do. Be like, I couldn't win it, so I bought it for you. (laughs) (laughs) All right. Season two, episode three, Promise, was written by Alice Oseman and directed by A. Ross Lynn. And according to Netflix, this is the one where Nick tries to come out to some of his teammates at a bonfire party after exams. Tao plans the perfect date. Things get weird between Tara and Darcy. That's it? That's it. I feel like we could have added like three or four more sentences there. Also, like, things get weird is a very interesting way to phrase what we see happen between yeah, them. Yeah, I feel like things get weird between Tao and L is a bit more mm-hmm, apt. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yes. I don't know. Interesting. This episode, I feel like, is the one that was the least what I expected it to be. Yeah. But I also, like, really didn't know. I had ideas, but this one was kind of a wild card. I really didn't know what to expect going into it. Yeah. Um, so I agree. I'm still trying to figure out what to make of some of it. Yeah. It starts out with just like, it's canvas. And at first I thought it was like poster board, but then when they do the shot where you can see the bat, I'm like, that's fully a canvas um, <laughs> on an easel. And they've painted, I think, ultimate L date onto this canvas. <laughs> it's so funny. And Tao suggests a restaurant because it's a classic, but Isaac says it's a bit boring. And then Tao suggests a theme park. (laughs) Um, And Charlie reminds Tao that he hates roller coasters. And I would just like to inform Charlie, there's a lot to do at a theme park besides just roller coasters. Roller coasters, yeah. Although I guess it depends on why Tao hates the roller coasters. Because if it's a motion sickness thing... That kind of eliminates a lot of the rides. That's if true. it's if it's you know, it really just depends. There's a lot of reasons. But like, I don't know, walk around, like go play games, go on like the dark ride where you have to like shoot ghosts with a laser that every theme park has. 
Yeah. <laughs> or like bumper cars. Yeah. Eat theme park food. Get some like fried Oreos. Go crazy. Yeah. And Isaac. <laughs> Isaac. Sweet, sweet Isaac. Ooh, what if you go to a bookshop and like choose a book for each other and have a cute little reading date? <laughs> it's adorable. Also, just because mm-hmm. his face, I'm like, you are yes. fantasizing. <laughs> yeah, he gets super into it. <laughs> mm-hmm. But also, that's such a fucking asexual date. <laughs> that is the <laughs> thing the asexual person in the room would say. <laughs> um, my note just says, a bookshop. Choose books for each other. Dash, I have read that Nick and Charlie date before in a fic. <laughs> <laughs> What but what Nick and Charlie date haven't you read though? I'm sure I I mean certainly. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But Tao says, Isaac, that's your dream date, not else. And I say it's also mine. Yeah. And Eddie doesn't want to do it. Boo. Okay, like part of his reason <laughs> is that he any book that he could think of to get for me, I've already read. Oh, okay, that's fair. And like valid, <laughs> he also doesn't want to enable my book buying habits. Uh-huh, uh-huh. And also, it would inherently require me being unsupervised in a bookstore for a little while. So I think he's also partially concerned that when we reconvene, I'll have a book for him and about two hundred and fifty dollars worth of books for myself, <laughs> um, which would defeat the purpose. Just a little bit. Um, So, like, is he wrong? Yes. But also, do I understand his point? No. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, my God. So then uh, Tal's like, okay, Charlie, what do you and Nick do for dates? And Charlie's like, I mean, we went to the beach, but he's got exams and I'm grounded, so... (laughs) Basic. (laughs) And I'm like, you said restaurant, sir. Restaurants are way more basic than the yeah, beach. Yeah, yeah. Take me on a beach date any day. Mm-hmm. Isaac says, Tal, you're really overthinking this. Uh, so I have very lengthy paragraph of notes. Do you mind if I read this? Go for it. Uh, Tal, parentheses, proving Isaac's point. I'm not. If this date doesn't work out, then I lose my best friend in the whole world. What about if we went to Ikea, like, in 500 days of summer? Point one. That is not a good movie to draw date inspiration from. That was not a healthy relationship. And that was the point of the film, Tao. Mm -hmm. And I also, just because of the look that Charlie and Isaac give him, I was like, what's the unspoken rest of this statement? Uh Charlie's like, Tao. And... That drew me to wondering where the nearest Ikea is to get. Because <laughs> I was like, well, because if it's like a bit of a hike away, then that's probably kind of what's going on here. <laughs> and so this unintentionally sent me down a bit of a rabbit hole. Because Ikea has been uh, like building a bit more of a presence in the UK over the last couple of years, I guess. Um, so apparently the nearest Ikea to Kent is at Lakeside in Essex, um, which according to this one article that I read is, quote, on the other side of the QE2 bridge, six miles away. Six miles away from what? I don't know because <laughs> I googled from like Kent, like this like city, to this Ikea and it's a 31 minute drive or a two hour train ride. Um, but like plus or minus because we don't know like exactly where right. in yeah. like that area they are. But apparently, IKEA did open a warehouse in Kent in spring of 2023. Uh, but for a while, when IKEA purchased the property, people were excited because they thought it was going to be a store, and so they were upset when they found out it was just a warehouse. I could see that. Um, yeah, but that was that was uh, a thing. I do, in fact, have links to the articles. <laughs> if anyone wants them, you can let me know. Amazing. <laughs> because I have the article that informed me about the location of the closest IKEA was from 2021 when IKEA like purchased the building that they were going to be putting this warehouse in, but they 
no one knew it was a warehouse yet. And then the mm-hmm. second one is from when the warehouse opened. Gotcha. Yeah. So my big takeaway from this scene mm-hmm. was that when it pans out and we can see kind of all of them in the tables next to them, we see two lunches. So this is lunch hour. Mm-hmm. So he has opened up his art room safe space lunch hour to town Isaac. And also there are three of them and only two lunches, which hurts. <laughs> so I, and I mean, this is kind of getting ahead of ourselves, but we're a fully spoiled podcast. So fuck it. <laughs> um, <laughs> this is why we are. Um, Cause Elle's painting is of all four of them in the art room. So I I don't think that this is a Charlie exclusive safe space. I think this was a, this group of humans safe space. And last season, like Charlie was in need of it. And so he was just kind of hunkering down. I guess the reason I thought they didn't is because they often asked like where he was. Yeah. And like, if they knew about the art room, they would have checked the art room. No, that's totally, that's entirely valid. I mean, yeah, it's also possible knows. that they, I don't know. I guess I just assumed that Elle was like, this is my safe place and these are my safe people. So I'm going to put us all in this mm, room and paint That's us. a good point. Mm-hmm. But because like we see her and Tao in the art room as sports day. Mm-hmm. So Isaac is really the only one that we haven't like seen in there. Yeah. But like Isaac is a book person. He's not an art person. So that yeah, makes sense. for sure. So, oh God, I have so many things to talk about in the library later. <laughs> yeah, girl was thriving in that scene. But anyway, <laughs> yeah, girl was also thriving in the next scene. Yes. Uh, because if y'all remember from last season, I wanted this so badly. Mm-hmm. So we have rugby practice. At the first time I watched this, which was, you know, at like seven o'clock in the morning on a fucking <laughs> Wednesday. What was it? Um, or a Thursday? I don't even know. Mm-hmm. Um, but Coach Singh tells Cy, Otis, Christian, and Nick, those four specifically, to collect the cones. I squeed. I was like, <laughs> whenever I heard it the first time, I said, Excuse me. How come all of them get to get cone duty, but Charlie had to do it by himself last season? Mm, good point. And then I, my note was like, do you think she's trying to push them together specifically because she knows that there's a disconnect? That could be it. Um, but my other note here says she asks Charlie to collect the rugby balls. Um, and then using teacher brain, I said, note that she says rugby balls and not just balls. <laughs> this is likely a very intentional choice. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. There are quite a few moments in this episode where I have little like teacher asides about <laughs> the behavior and choices of various uh, adult characters. I'm excited. That's some of my favorite stuff from you. <laughs> like, give me all of those thoughts. <laughs> yeah. So you're you're gonna like some of my Mr. Lang thoughts then. Yes. Um, so we see, uh, Nick turns to look at Charlie and just looking at him, picking up rugby balls, we get a leaves moment. And I just like gasped the first time I was like, I was like, oh my God, this is just like another example of how strong his feelings are for Charlie. Like the boy is literally just walking away and Nick is like, damn, I really like him. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. So cute. Mm -hmm. But he's kind of brought back to reality by Otis, who tells him about the end of GCSE party in the woods next week, uh, which Sai says is going to be wild. (laughs) Um, And he says that uh, he says, you guys should come. And like everyone is knows that he means him and Charlie. Mm -hmm. Uh, Nick kind of brushes them off and tries to walk away. And Otis is like, we're not friends with Harry anymore. (laughs) Yeah, Otis is really pressed. You could tell, like, when he first walks up and starts saying, hey, did you hear about... You can see he's, like, he's nervous to, like, Mm -hmm. even be approaching Nick. Which is, like, as you should be. You guys need to apologize. I want 
a like eight episode, ten episodes. No, I want a ten episode web se- short series of Cy Christian and Otis's goings on and conversations yes. throughout <laughs> season one, and then the first two episodes of season two. Um, I, possibly ongoing. Um, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> But yeah, Christian also adds that they're sorry about what happened and that they should have spoken up. And, like, they're owning up to the fact that they kind of sucked in, like, a bystander way. Which is good. It's good to own up to it when someone does something fucked and you tacitly allow it to happen. Um, So good job on growth. Because this was probably a really difficult conversation for the three of them to have. Like, to come to the point of realizing that they fucked up. and to have this conversation because like they also know that they're going to have to regain nick's trust right and nick says that he knows that they aren't like harry and uh that it took him a while to realize what a dick harry was because again that's the strongest word they will let nick say on this show and then christian says the iconic i seriously don't blame you for fighting him i know you and charlie are really good mates (laughs) and cy and otis just are like (sighs) <sighs> so I, like instantly closes his eyes he's like fuck <laughs> like you i like i feel like he like almost wants to like pinch the bridge of his nose but is trying to keep it together <laughs> oh just yeah. goes straight for the side eye it's just like you motherfucker <laughs> yes he is and then we get <laughs> oh my god <laughs> the greatest moment of this episode <laughs> I love the way that they executed this. Please talk about it because I can't stop laughing long enough to have it <laughs> <in> your thought. <laughs> okay, so we get the Really Good Mates montage, which we have these like adorable arched bubble letters that say Really Good Mates. It's like super kawaii too because it's like sparkles yes. and it's, yeah. Yes, it's adorable. And we get the shot of them um, in the storage closet from episode one kissing then we get the beanbag makeout session from the montage in episode one and we get the sweet bottom left corner kiss with nelly trapped between them also from episode one's makeout montage just like real quick cut of those yeah. three moments and when it cuts back n- error 404 nick not found. yes <laughs> <laughs> he just kind of shuts down and dips uh-huh. And just leaves. And Otis and then, is like, why did you say that? But Nick is still definitely in earshot because, like, you can see his shoulder still in the frame. Uh-huh. None of these people in this show, like, have any semblance of, like, there is no object permanence. <laughs> it's so true. <laughs> uh, and, like, I mean, he wants to tell them so bad. And I think that. All of the pressure that he's putting on himself is exactly what's freezing him up about it. Oh, yeah. He needs to just relax a little bit. He does not relax at all this episode. This is the episode mm-hmm. of No Chill Nick Nelson. Mm-hmm. So then we go to another really phenomenal scene. Mm-hmm. I love this. Charlie's in there putting away the rugby balls and Nick walks in and says, I still couldn't come out to any of them. And Charlie's like, Nick, there isn't a deadline and Nick thinks it's annoying that people think that they're like, and Charlie's like, uh, best bros. And it gives him like a little fist bump on the yeah. shoulder. It's adorable. <laughs> so cute. And Nick is like, I'm going to come out to some of them after exams. If I don't come out soon, then we're going to get found out, which is like, I don't know how you haven't been found out yeah. already. <laughs> this, this is something that this episode kind of toes the line between, I think, in a really good way of, like, the kind of dual nature of coming out. Because, like, on the one hand, like, you don't owe it to anybody, right? And there isn't a deadline. And I think that those mm-hmm. are good and important messages. But they also balance that really well with the reality, which is that, You're in a relationship and, like, you both, like, you want people to know about it. Right. Uh, Like, like right here, Nick says it's annoying when people think they're best bros. And at the end, when Charlie talks about how there's a part of him that just wants everyone to know. Yeah. And how it's like, okay, well, like, you can't have both. 
it's right. it's impossible like you're gonna be hiding and you're gonna be keeping secrets until you're out because like the alternative is that the rumor mill starts going and they already know how awful that's gonna be and so mm -hmm. like nick's anxiety like it's so real and so like relatable because it's like on the one hand like there's no perfect way to like balance it because right. there's no right answer you just have to exactly like, just bear it until you know until you're ready you just have yeah. to be ready mm -hmm. it's just then i think that the really difficult thing for them is that they're both really impatient not in not i i think impatient maybe isn't the right word but they they want to be together and they don't want to hide but they also have to navigate the difficulty that is coming out. Yeah. And it's something that Charlie can't really help Nick with as much because he didn't get to do it on his own terms, which is its own problem. But this is an experience that Charlie doesn't have. Like, obviously, like, he came out to his close friends and to his family. But in terms of, like, the school community at large, he got outed. And it's an entirely mm -hmm. different and it's awful but it's an entirely different experience. And so it's just this really interesting ground that they're treading that I feel like doesn't often get talked about. Yeah. I mean, like I, I had not even thought of, I hadn't thought of it from that perspective, like that he, this is something that he has no experience in because it was taken from him. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, that's just something I hadn't thought about. It's really freaking smart of you, Alyssa. <laughs> Uh, to quote one of my students today, I'm super smart. I'm like <laughs> so, so smart. <laughs> hmm. um, so Charlie takes this opportunity to do some top-notch flirting. And so Nick is like, we're going to get found out. And Charlie says, oh, it's because you keep kissing me at school. And Nick is like, excuse me, I think you're also to blame for that. And Charlie's like, um, no, I've never initiated a, a kiss at school. He specifically so, says, don't know what you mean. I have never initiated a kiss at school, <laughs> which we all know is false. See yeah. also really good mates montage from approximately five seconds ago. <laughs> <laughs> Very true. <laughs> um, so Nick starts, you know naming them off and charlie's deflecting them saying that doesn't count or you know you started that one um and nick says what about and then charlie kisses him and he says fine you win and nick full-on like giggles and it is adorable mm -hmm. and then a lot of kissing ensues until the door opens coach sing <laughs> walks in Starts to say she needs something, processes what is happening, looks away. Nick and Charlie, it, it happens in like such quick succession. It's excellent. It reminds me of that like TikTok sound of the like, and he looks at me and I look at him. <laughs> yes. As I'm like making these notes, that was like playing in my head. <laughs> but yeah, like she processes what's going on and like very quickly looks away. Nick and Charlie realize she's there and the music cuts out exactly in time it's like perfect yeah i love that she has to do like a i like she almost seemed like she was gonna say something when she looked back the second time and then was like nah <laughs> I'm just, i gotta go yeah mm -hmm. yeah charlie is just a deer in headlights his eyes are uh -huh. massive I and mean, so is nick but nick is struggling to breathe <laughs> yeah nick nick has died <laughs> And, like, I have to imagine that for Nick, this is, like, extremely mortifying because, like, he's been playing rugby for who knows how long. Like, this mm -hmm. is someone he probably has, a like, a good, like, relationship with as, as like, a, an athlete. Yeah. And so, like, for him, this must be, like... And he's the captain. Yeah. So, like, they work closely together to run this team. Uh, so, yeah, it's just, like, you know, there's, like, a lot at play. Yeah. Um... <laughs> And then we get the title card, which is a beach, and it breaks my heart. Yep. It's like we get the wave and the seagull, because Nick thinks he promised to come out at the beach, and he's stressed about not keeping that promise and letting Charlie down and being just like Ben. I am sorry. This episode cannot continue because I'm literally crying now. <laughs> mm, sorry. So, <laughs> the 
this episode has further been delayed by Alyssa's tears. <laughs> like actual tears are in my eyes, Ashley. Like this episode's never gonna come out. We'll just no, move on. No. <laughs> oh my god. This this episode's like rough emotionally. After the um title card, we go to Coach Singh's office. Um, and Nick kind of like knocks and he like makes his way in and Coach Singh explains that she made Nick captain because he was the only person who could unite the players into a team. But she's noticed that like Nick has been, there's been distance growing. (laughs) She says, I don't want to make assumptions, but I assume that that has Mm -hmm. something to do with it. That (laughs) phrasing uh, stuck out to me too. Mm -hmm. I don't want to make an assumption, but I assume. (laughs) Yeah. I don't want to, but I have. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) Which like, you know, she's right. Yeah. But, like, the whole time she's talking, it, like, cuts back to Nick, who, like, looks – he's so upset, like mm-hmm. – He's nervous. That, yeah. And also, like, again, it comes back to, like, this is a teacher that he has a relationship and who he respects and who he's earned the respect and trust of because she named him captain. And, like, not only is this embarrassing for him, but she's ostensibly saying, you let me down, mate. Mm-hmm. And, like, you know, it hurts to think about. Yeah. But then she kind of, like, shifts it. And tells Nick to let her know immediately if any of the rugby lads say anything out of line. And I just go, uh, Nick, this might be a good time to tell her about Harry. But I also yeah. totally, like, I totally understand that Nick is having a lot of feelings and probably isn't really fully processing any of what's happening. Yeah. And you can kind of see that in, like, his look and the way that he, like, responds. He is not here. Yeah, it, he's hearing it all, but it's not it's not um, processing yet. And also when she says that, though, you can kind of see his demeanor change just a little bit, soften a little bit. Yeah. Where he's like, oh, okay. I'm not in trouble. <laughs> yeah. And then she she shares, like, her experiences in women's rugby and that it was bad even then. And there are a lot of lesbians in women's rugby. And she talks about her wife. And that she remembers what it was like telling her friends and that some took it better than others. And Nick just like, no, no one on the team knows. And again, we have this message that a lot of people keep telling Nick of like, you don't owe them that information. And it's like, yes, but (laughs) he wants to and he's having a hard time with it. And I feel like the fact that he keeps getting this message of like, you don't owe them that is like also getting in his way because it's kind of like feeding the nervous part of his brain that doesn't want to do this. It's like, well, Mm -hmm. you don't have to because you don't owe it to them, even though what he wants is to tell them. Right. Uh, That makes sense. And I think he he gets there, though, right? Because like when Sarah says that about Stefan later, he's like, I'm not doing it for him. I'm doing it for me. Yeah. Yeah. So it takes him a while to get there. But yeah, I think you're right. It's definitely not helping him yeah but also this scene i can imagine it was probably super emotional for kit to have to film this and hear these words and know that like that was taken from him as well so it's a hard scene for multiple reasons oh i didn't think about that yeah (sighs) So he gets up and goes to leave, and she gives him a smirk, <laughs> of all smirks, and is like, uh, and also maybe just keep the kissing outside of team practice. And Nick looks really embarrassed, and then also is like smiling <laughs> a yeah. little bit as well. And like, that's like, where like you get like, it's this really like small, like quick, like little character moment between the two of them, but like you, mm-hmm. it's like these are people who have been working together for a while and who like have a rapport. Cause as I was, I was like, that is the way that I talk to my kiddos when they make stupid choices. Like come like March, April. I'm like, seriously? Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's exactly what it is. And yeah, I was like her, her smug little smile laugh is everything. Yeah. She's trying her best. Trying her best not to crack up. (laughs) But also, she knows she can kind of fuck with him a bit. Yeah. She doesn't have to hide it as well. Yeah. And it's also the really awesome Alice Oseman thing of this appropriate levity. 
Like we have yes. a tense moment. Now let's release it in a way that makes sense for the characters and the time and place. Right. Which I've been appreciating a lot this season in case y'all can't tell. Yeah. It was <laughs> very much needed this season. So. Mm-hmm. Um, I do wish that we had gotten the scene from the comics of her talking to her wife mm-hmm. afterwards. Yeah. I'm sad that that didn't make it, but we got the photo. So I'll take that. I wonder if it was because that would be something that would be like fairly easy. I wonder if it was like cut for time or something. Yeah, it might have been. So then Charlie is in form. Uh, he's like doodling or something. I was doodling just one big circle made out of squiggles. Relatable. Yeah. That's how a lot of my notes look. Mm hmm. So uh, Mr. Lang, right, he, he comes up. He's like, I'm still waiting for your coursework essay. And he's got like a couple of them in his hand. And, you know, we know that Charlie's lying. Uh, Mr. Lang also knows that Charlie is lying, by the way. Um, And then my note here says, also, Mr. Lang's tone and body language are 100% the body language of a teacher who's really rooting for a kid to get their shit together and is also pretty sure they're about to be heartbroken and let down by that same kid who is not going to do the thing that they want, that, that he needs them to do. Not that I'm speaking from personal experience or anything, and this totally isn't making me cry. I have no idea what you're talking about um, because it it's so well done, and it's this really subtle thing. But it, like, and again, it's something that only like people who've been in this position of like authority over children is are going to understand. Um, it's like educators, parents, coaches, and anyone who works with kids, but like. You want the kids to succeed, but there's only so much you can do. And kind of the the information the odds are saying, like, Charlie is not going to get this in and he's going to fail. And I don't know what the consequences for that particular assignment would be. But you're also, like, really rooting for them. Like, maybe they will, you know? And it... um. It got to me. And I, I also... It made me kind of, like, thinking in the comics... If they d- decide to go ahead with the like having Charlie apply for head boy, I want Mr. Lang to be the teacher who talks to him about yeah. it. I thought I wanted it to be Mr. Ajay, but I think it should be Mr. Lang. I mean, he's the closest to him. He's the closest. He's his form teacher. Like, it makes sense. And like, just this very little thing, I was mm-hmm. like, yeah, no, it's got to be Mr. Lang. I won't be happy if it's any other teacher. I mean, he knows how smart Charlie is. Uh-huh. It's just like he's just being Henri. Just, just do the coursework, my guy. He's being a shitty fucking 14, 15 year old. Like, but that's the other. Like, I'm like, I'm worried that Mr. Lang is taking it a little personally at the same time. And I'm like, come on, guy, you need some. But, but I also very heavily relate. Like, mm-hmm. I can, I could rattle off right now, like five, six kids who I've had this exact experience and conversation with. Yeah. And, unfortunately like more than half the time they do end up letting you down but (laughs) yeah so then we go to a montage i love this thing it's so good it's so good i like so we have these like three little sets in the library and they're like divided by stacks which is an awesome use of a library as a set yes and the camera tracks from section to section for these three different little vignettes that we get of like Tao, yes. Nick and Charlie, and Isaac and James. And it's just such intelligent and such creative use of like the camera and the space. And it just, it makes me very happy from like an artistic and cinematographic yes. point of view. And the song, the way, like, the song kicks in right as we see Tao, like, it's so Mm -hmm. good. Yeah. Um, So it starts out with Tao, and he's Googling how to ask out a friend. And the Google suggestions are how to ask out a friend over text, how to ask out a friend without ruining the friendship, how to ask out a friend without it being awkward, and how to ask out a friend who is a girl. And I'm like, are these suggestions or is this your history? Because these <laughs> all sound like things that you have Googled. <laughs> yes. I, my note was the fact that he didn't immediately click 
how to ask out a friend without ruining the friendship is very upsetting because uh-huh. that's what he's thinking. Yep. <laughs> so then, like you said, we like kind of pan over the stacks and we see Nick and Charlie on like a little love seat um, in front of a table. And Nick is saying that he doesn't want to do this anymore. And Charlie's encouraging him to study. You know, he's like, this is your last exam. You've got this, like we can do this. And he starts using Paris like as a motivation mm-hmm. in the summer. He's like, just think about us in Paris and then it'll be the summer holidays. And like, you just have to get through this. And so Nick is like, okay. And then he remembers that Charlie hasn't done his history coursework. And so he says, you know, you've helped me so much. What about your coursework? Like I can help you with that. And Charlie lies so smoothly that it's scary. It's fine. <laughs> it's done. I'm like, he didn't even hesitate. Nope. Like it's it's very worrisome. I don't like it. <laughs> um, I do want to mention that um, Charlie is trying to get Nick to focus on the topic of ionic compounds, yes. uh, which in my notes I fully typed out as iconic compounds <laughs> before <laughs> I realized my mistake and corrected it. Um, but also, they are in fact Chekhov's iconic compounds. Yes. <laughs> I did it again. I didn't mean to do that. I didn't mean to say iconic compounds, but I did. Oh my god, I didn't even notice. <laughs> <laughs> They're Chekhov's ionic compounds. <laughs> I love it. I love Charlie's delivery too of like ionic compounds. Yeah. Like so flirty. Then <laughs> we pan over another stack. And it is James and Isaac fixing up the read with pride table. Mm -hmm. I love James. I love James so much. James is great. I mean, do you want to take this as a moment to talk about your experience with um, Bradley? Yes. So he is so lovely. Bradley is so lovely. (laughs) Um, I entered a a giveaway for LoverCon, which is like a new con that just sprang up and they, it was virtual, um, and they just did, like, a retweet this, and you'll be entered to win, you know, like, a to get in the meet and greet with him or whatever. So I retweeted it, and I ended up winning, which was amazing. And so uh, it was, like, me and, I don't know, 15-ish people, maybe, were in the room, the Zoom room with him. And we had, I think, originally it was supposed to be 20 minutes. But they said, like, if they had room, it would go longer. And I think it went about 30 minutes. Mm -hmm. Um, And so they let us have a little more time. But he was so sweet. And he let everybody, like, I only prepared one question. (laughs) Because I thought, if I get a chance to ask a question, I want to have one prepared. Mm -hmm. I didn't realize they were going to let us have all the time we wanted. Some people had, like, six questions, like, just popping them out. like. And so he was really good about making sure that every single person got a chance to come off mic, talk to him, ask all of the questions that they had. Like before they got muted again, he'd be like, anything else? You got anything else? And so it's like, people don't do that, you know? So it's, it was really nice and sweet. And my question for him was now that he is a part of a show that means so much to people and is like touching people and changing people. Like, was there a show that meant a lot to him that, changed him or shaped him in some way um and he said heartbreak high uh because that was the first time he ever saw autistic representation plus it has a bunch of queer representation so it was like a big moment for him and that show really shaped something within himself is what he said and so that was a lovely interaction that i had and he was just so he was so cute and so bubbly and like Aww. very much like the same kind of energy <laughs> as we <laughs> see from james that's amazing i love that so much um yeah so isaac asks james he's like isn't it your last exam today too thus confirming that nick and charlie are being way too loud and not at all subtle in this library and i'm surprised that isaac didn't like Lead, like, r- remove a book, look at them, and shush them through the stack. <laughs> I didn't even pick up on that. That is so funny. Uh, so I rewound and, like, replayed this a lot because <laughs> of what I'm about to talk about. Yeah. 
So, yeah, I picked up on a lot in this little interaction. Uh, James says yes, and that he probably should be doing some last minute studying. Uh, and I quote, but this is more fun. And he like is unfurling like a fan. That's the progress pl- pride flag. <laughs> and it like opens with a really satisfying like thwoosh. <laughs> yeah. As those fans are want to do. And I now bring to you a very special edition of Isaac Book Watch, Read with Pride Edition. <laughs> yeah, my note is James and Isaac fixing up the Read with Pride table. I'm not taking notes here because Alyssa will. <laughs> <laughs> and that Alyssa did. <laughs> um, so, and these are just the ones that between pausing and like looking and zooming And I had to go to Reddit for a few that I could make out. There are others still on display that just like from the angles or there's like books you can't quite make out. And I don't recognize the covers. Um, But we have one of the books and it's off to the side. um, But it's the first one that I noticed and recognized. And part of the reason I'm going to explain. But it says the title on the, the copy that they have is George by Alex Gino. That book is not called that anymore. Uh, the book has been retitled and republished as Melissa. Um, because the the book is about a trans child. And George is actually the trans child's dead name. Oh. And after receiving a lot of criticism, Alex Gino was like, hey, you guys are right. I was wrong. Um, And actually, before the reprint, was actually actively encouraging people to deface their copies and, like, cross out George and write Melissa, which is the character's name. And it was republished. And so I, it kind of, like, flagged me. I was like, why do they have a George copy? But then I was like, oh, it's a school library. So, like, it's entirely probable. But I also am disappointed in James and Isaac for not defacing it. And writing the correct yeah. title because it was encouraged by the author. Right. But yeah, so that caught my attention straight away. I was like, that happened like in 2018 or 2019. And I was like, maybe it didn't happen in the UK for some reason, but it definitely did. It just confirmed that the reprint happened in Scholastic UK as well. So that was a thing. I haven't read the book. I just, I know about this controversy um, uh, we also have My Magic Family, written by Lottie Jefferson, illustrated by Sharon Davey. I Wish You All the Best by Mason Dever. By Mason Dever. Beyond the Gender Binary by Alok Vade Menon. All Boys Aren't Blue by George M. Johnson. By Bisexual, Pansexual, Fluid, and Non-Binary Youth by Rich Savin Williams. The Kingdom of Sand by Andrew Holleran. The Prom, a novel based on the hit Broadway musical. Uh, and if you want, I could go into a little tangent about both that hit Broadway musical and the film adaptation, because I have thoughts, because I've seen both. Um, Nate Plus One by Kevin Van Wyne. By, no, Kevin Van Wy. Leah on the Offbeat by Becky Albertalli. Uh, this Place is Still Beautiful by, uh, I'm not sure if I'm saying this right, Chi Chi, or Z, uh, it's X-I-X-I Chan, and I forget how that's pronounced. Um, Bird Girl by Maya Rose Craig, Girl, Woman, Other by Bern- Bernardine Evaristo, which is on my list because I've heard it's amazing, um, and Princess Ever After by Connie Glynn. And I've saved for last, intentionally, the book that is prominently featured at like the center top of the like main table, which is Ace, What Asexuality Reveals About Desire, Society, and the Meaning for Sexuality by Angela Chen. And obviously in... Towards the end of the sh- season, that book becomes very important because Isaac comes back to this display and grabs that book, um, and it provides a lot of comfort for him. And I'm going to wait until we get to that to talk about it because I have a lot to say about that scene as well. But those are all the books, um, except for one. <laughs> uh, he's also got one under the crook of his elbow, which most people online speculate is the book that he's actually currently reading and isn't one of the ones on the display. Um, and that is Night Sky with Exit Wounds by Ocean Vuong. Um, and, you know, so, like, they're, like, chatting. They're, like, fixing up this table. Um, and James reaches and picks up by Bisexual, Pansexual, Fluid, and Non-Binary Youth, which actually then reveals another book behind it. 
uh, which is My Shadow is Pink by Scott Stewart. Um, and he asks Isaac if he's read by, and Isaac's like, of course I've read that one. Yeah. <laughs> I haven't. So I don't know. Like, yeah, it should be on our list for oh, our, yeah. our book club. I mean, I'm assuming it's like a, a collection of, or of like essays or interviews with binary pansexual fluid and non-binary youth, which is like definitely mm-hmm. something that I'm interested in reading, but I hadn't read it. Still haven't. Same. Yes. So then we go back to Tao and he is looking at an article. We don't see what number one is. We start with number two and it says, be big hearted, not big headed, be confident, not cocky. When choosing an activity or topic, prioritize what they will enjoy. He takes that to heart. (laughs) Yeah. Which is good. Uh, (laughs) He should take that into heart. Not just when talking to Elf. Yes. (laughs) Yes. <laughs> I just he takes it a bit too much to heart, I think, for this date. So yeah. uh, he's 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 absorbing all these things and not he's like forgetting himself and everything he mm-hmm. knows about what she would like, you know? Um so number three is uh, a cheesy pickup line can help break the ice. If you're meeting someone for the first time, a cheesy pickup line can be a fun way to break the ice and show your sense of humor. However, you don't want to overdo it or come across as insincere. Use a cheesy pickup line or two, but then switch to a more natural conversation. And then it gave examples. <laughs> Please tell me the examples. <laughs> it says, here's a couple of examples to get you started. Are you a magician? Because whenever I look at you, everyone else disappears. <laughs> and the other one is much cheesier, I think. <laughs> Are you a parking ticket? Because you've got fine written all over you. <laughs> oh my god, I hate that. I hate that. Yeah, that one's horrible. <laughs> like the first one was cute. Like that was an appropriate amount of cheese. The second one was a bit nauseating. It's like that's a bold one to put in after telling them not to come on too strong with it. Yeah, that's <laughs> about as strong as a punch to the face. Yeah. Um, Okay, so number four, save all your flirting for your special friend. Concentrate your efforts on one lady and she will notice the extra special attention. To which he gives like a, that makes sense, face. Like Tao's out here flirting with anybody else. (laughs) And so then he goes back to Google and he opens buffwise.com, six ways to look good. And it says, choose a haircut that complements your face shape. A short, sharp haircut can make a boyish boyish face look more chiseled and masculine. So we see where that haircut idea came from, too. And his, like, mind is blown by this idea. He's like, yeah. oh, my God, I have to cut my hair short so that I look manly. And yeah. <laughs> not like a dumbass. <laughs> yeah. This is nonsense. Just hang out with her like normal. <laughs> So then we go to uh, the GCSEs. And I think that this is like a really good contrast to the math exam. It's like Nick okay. is a lot yeah. less anxious. He feels like confident and his desk is like well organized. And he like opens the book right. Like he's like ready. It's like <laughs> it reminded me of like when I was swimming and it's like you do certain things on like take your mark and go. Uh So, like, she's, like, and your exam starts, and he, like, has his hands, (laughs) like, I'm, like, are you about to start speed stacking cups? Like, he's got his hands, like, (laughs) and then as soon as she says now, he, like, opens it, and he, like, starts, like, answering, like, he's working more kind of in line with what the other students during the math exam were doing. Mm -hmm. But he's just, like, much more confident. And then, in the year of our Lord 2023... We get a clock wipe, <laughs> and I am dead. <laughs> I seriously, my my note in all caps says a clock wipe in 2023. I am deceased. <laughs> I love a good wipe. <laughs> yes. Um, and it like kind of goes to Charlie finally working on his essay, and it says. Uh, he's got the like essay question and stuff and it says this question is about government reaction explain the connection between the atlantic revolutions and the following 
the Peterloo Massacre, the Cato Street Conspiracy, and the Six Acts. And I don't know what any of that means. I'm assuming yeah, it's some either. British history that I <laughs> didn't need to know. Um, and then my note for Charlie is, look at you, writing your essay that's due at the end of the fucking day. And I am wondering, where is he supposed to be? Like, does he have, like, a free hour? Like, what's going on here? That's a good question. Like, are you skipping other classes to do this essay? Because that is also not good. Yeah, I didn't even think about that. But then, and I, I don't really know what I'm talking about, but my note just says, very aesthetic shot of exam room. Probably it's, they show it from above a mm-hmm. lot. And it's like the way that it cuts from like looking at Nick to like being above him. And then yeah. the coach thing is like walking up and down the aisles. It's just, it's very, it's very well done. Oh yeah. And then I texted you. I remember why I got distracted and didn't write down what I was talking about. <laughs> it's because I texted you about Wes Anderson. <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> and coach thing looks so hot. I'm like, in this outfit. Yeah. I have to imagine people are like, whoa, what is happening? Why? Mm-hmm. At least one kid is like, why do you look like that? Yeah. Who are you? Yeah. Have I seen you before? <laughs> um, and then we get, but then we get this really cool, like, side by side. And, like, Nick is, like, super focused and confident. And he's doing his work. And Char- I, it just says, <laughs> disaster, Charlie. He's, like, schlumped. Yeah. So, we see Nick has a question about ionic compounds. And we get this adorable shot of his face as he, like, remembers the interaction with Charlie. And he kind of smiles twofold because he's remembering this interaction that he had with charlie who he is in love with and thinks is adorable and also he knows the answer to the question because charlie helped him study and he can remember things that charlie tells him <laughs> meanwhile charlie's face is typing asd i didn't write out the whole thing just because at this point in the note taking process my sick brain kind of broke but yeah fair yeah and so then charlie removes his key smash from his paper and resumes typing and he manages to hand it in with five minutes to spare yes um so my mr lang notes so number one i said that uh charlie hands his essay in in a fancy project sleeve no less Mm -hmm. and i said and here mr lang's body language and tone are that of a teacher who is very proud of the student they were really hoping would get their shit together, but refuses to let Charlie know that he is proud, right? Because he kind of has, like, a bit of, like, an aloof, like, and with yeah. five minutes to spare. And I'm like, like, you can see, like, a little bit of, like, a smile underneath it, but he's, like, trying to be all, like, aloof and cool and, like, you know, a little bit judgmental. Mm-hmm. But, like, you can tell he's, like, really proud and, like, really relieved. It's just so sweet. It is very sweet. And then, yeah, back to Nick. Yes. And so Nick, the exam's over and everybody just like jumps up and starts running out. And Coach Singh is just standing there. And Nick is the only one to say, thank you, Miss. Yeah. And she's like, well done. (laughs) He's so sweet. Mm -hmm. All right. So everybody bursts out of the exam hall. They're yelling like, freedom. And the rugby lads are hype 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 end of gcse party in the woods near size tonight and remember to bring your notes to burn them (laughs) and i was like that makes me anxious and i get even more anxious later when we arrive at the party and i see (laughs) exactly how much they will be burning (laughs) i the part of the reason that i didn't take as detailed notes of like the party stuff is because it made me the whole thing made me like physically ill with anxiety and like (laughs) nausea yeah so nick is like smiling at the rugby lads and harry comes up Mm. and just sucks the life right out of him my my note says harry from behind broke hugging nick and i hate it yeah nick hates it too he's like please don't touch me everyone hates it uh, Charlie comes up and gives Nick a huge hug in front of everybody. Again, not being subtle. But before we even see Charlie, Nick starts beaming, and we know that he's <laughs> off screen. Especially with 
the scowl that he just mm-hmm. gave Perry for him to turn around and beam like that. Complete one. It was Charlie. Mm-hmm. And this hug is the like hug that we got in the like little teaser <laughs> behind the scenes thing that we got. And everybody was speculating, like, why are they hugging so hard? Like, have they not seen each other? Is this? Yeah, I feel like after an exam, if I had someone to hug, I'd want to give them a particularly big yeah, cathartic hug. For sure. And this is like, now they have the Paris trip meeting. And I'm assuming it's like in a handful of days at this point because of the next episode. So there's a lot to celebrate. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um. So then we kind of cut to... Okay, well, first of all, Gay, this hug is not platonic. <laughs> it's not platonic at all. I, like, Charlie is fully off the ground, right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. And he, like, runs to him. <laughs> like, can you be more obvious? Again, in sight of uh, everyone, including Harry Green. Like, I'm like, guys, I love you. I'm happy for you. I don't want bad things to happen. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and then Mr. Farouk comes out and he's like, hey. If you're not staying for the Paris trip, can you please go home? And then he's like, please leave, please. (laughs) (laughs) And everybody starts kind of like going their separate ways. And Charlie asks Nick how the exam went. And Nick says it went, it went well. Um, And then we cut to Sahar, El, Tara, and Darcy all walking over Mm -hmm. for the Paris meeting. And Sahar and who are practicing the French? Sahar and Elle are practicing their French. Yeah. And Tara and Darcy are flirting. <laughs> well, yeah. They're Tara and Darcy. And Darcy's like, we're going to have, how many days is it? Five whole days, sleeping in the same bed, hanging out all day. You're going to be so annoyed with me by the time it's over. And Tara says, oh, but I love you because you're annoying. And then record scratch everybody pauses Tara's like freaking out a little bit that she let it slip Mm -hmm. um and Darcy is just full-on frozen like she doesn't move it doesn't look like she's breathing she's just standing there like shit Mm -hmm. um so Tara starts to immediately backpedal and she's saying you know like oh that, that was a casual I love you like I'm not asking you to say it back I didn't mean it like that and Darcy just she just says yeah and then runs away and it's like at this point in time we're not really sure why she's Mm -hmm. being like this and so it's it feels real without the context of like what's going on it feels really out of character yes i was gonna say shocking it feels very like i'm shocked that this is happening because i think it's pretty obvious how darcy feels about tara yeah and darcy kind of like leaves but then she's like telling sahar like i think vampire prom should be a vampire theme and here's why and sahar says that's a terrible idea uh but vampire prom is a great idea as ashley and i can confirm because we've both been to a couple um and you should not let anyone tell you otherwise darcy vampire prom is great yes I, l- I figured we would both have that note. I'm like, va- <laughs> a vampire-themed prom. That sounds fun. Like, I don't know. Maybe, like... Once a year? Just, like, a bunch of nerds hanging out. Mm-hmm. Maybe, perhaps, in... Los Angeles. Buffy's high school. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so then we go into the Paris meeting. Mm-hmm. And we get Sahar kind of, like, meeting the group. Um, But first, we get the, uh like, packets... Which are the yes. most aesthetic school trip packets ever. <laughs> yeah. I mean, the art teacher did it. Yeah, they're like the friend. Well, Alice Oseman did them. Well, sure, but not actually. Like, not probably not really, but like, Alice definitely helped design them because they're very yeah. Alice art style. Uh, but yeah. they're like the French flag, but it's like a watercolor kind of thing. Mm-hmm. And it says like, Truham Hicks Paris trip in like an aesthetically pleasing font. It's not just a wall of text, single space, 12 point yeah. times new Roman font with appropriately bolded and underlined uh, statements. And so we see Mr. Ajayi and Mr. Farouk walks up and he says, Yusuf, on time as always. Mm-hmm. And he's like, Nathan, are you also having regrets about signing up for this? 
And Mr. Hajani says, ah, it'll be a laugh, won't it? Farouk's <laughs> face. He's like, are you being fucking serious right now? A laugh is the last thing that I I'm do uh, want to rewind because we do have another Isaac book watch. Oh, yes. And I have a bit of a rant about this one. <laughs> so I think it's um, Tara is like, oh, Isaac, what are you reading? And he's like, it's called Book Lovers. Um, and the book in question is Book Lovers by Emily Henry, which I have read. Okay. I do not think Isaac would like this book. I think he would be drawn in by the title, but I think when he read the blurb, I do not think that he would choose this book. So I'm going to read it to you. This is the like blurb. This is um, both on Goodreads and on Barnes and Noble. It has the same one. Um, this is a very popular book, by the way. Emily Henry is kind of like one of the darlings of book talk. Okay. And I like her stuff well enough. I just do not think that Isaac would like it, given the other things he has chosen to read. So it's uh, the tagline is one summer, two rivals, a plot twist they didn't see coming. Um, <laughs> Nora Stevens' life is books. She reads them all, and she's not the that type of heroine. Not the plucky one, not the laid back dream girl, and especially not the sweetheart. In fact, the only people Nora is a heroine for are her clients for whom she lands enormous deals as a cutthroat literary agent and her beloved little sister, Libby. Which is why she agrees to go to Sunshine Falls, North Carolina for the month of August when Libby begs her for a sister's trip away, with visions of a small-town transformation for Nora, who she's convinced needs to become the heroine in her own story. I need to add an aside here. Libby is, like, obsessed with Hallmark movies, which this is kind of, like, alluding to and stuff in a bunch of ways. Um, <laughs> so Libby is orchestrating a like hallmark movie meet cute or she's trying to anyway but instead of picnics and meadows or run-ins with a handsome country doctor or bulging forearmed bartender nora keeps bumping into charlie lastra a bookish brooding editor from back in the city it would be a mute cute a meet cute if not for the fact that they've met many times and it's never been cute if nora knows she's not an ideal heroine charlie knows he's nobody's hero but as they are thrown together again and again in a series of coincidences no editor worth their salt would allow, what they discover might just unravel the carefully crafted stories they've written about themselves. It is a very straight rivals to lovers rom-com. But he wants to believe in romance. He does. I just don't think that he would be like full. I, I don't know. I mean, you know, maybe he doesn't love every book yeah. he reads, but he doesn't strike me as someone who would like he's gonna finish every book that he says yeah he's yeah just he doesn't like it he's gonna finish it and then move on mm -hmm. but i do have a recommendation for isaac if you are looking for something similar but better i highly recommend the dead romantics by ashley poston very good book also uh involves a ghost Ooh, i like that yeah yeah no that one's really good dead romantics is really good um I recommend that to everybody who is listening, not just to Isaac. Um. <laughs> so, yeah, we have the teachers. <laughs> Mr. Jai is already making some major hard eyes. Oh, yeah. At Mr. Farouk. Oh, Ajai's had a crush on this man for a minute already. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, can you blame him? <laughs> um, <laughs> Elle notices that Tal's missing. She's like, where's Tal? And everyone just kind of looks around. Uh, and then James comes running in. I love that he's always just like either speed walking or like running. <laughs> it's very cute. Mm -hmm. um, and he's like telling Isaac that there's a party tonight and he should come. And it's, he's very obviously like asking him out. Mm -hmm. um, and Isaac says, yeah, he'll come to the party. And he says, everybody else, all the friends should come too. Mm-hmm. And so he goes to walk away and Tara's like, oh my God, Isaac, what was that? And Isaac just says, he's nice. <laughs> and everyone's just so excited. Yeah. And then I have a little like spiel about how much I love James, which I feel like I've already said a hundred times. We, just, mm -hmm. we don't get a lot of him, but I feel like I fell for his character so quickly. He just seems so sweet and genuine mm -hmm. and lovely. And I just want him to find someone who will accept all of his love that he has to give and give yeah. it back to him equally. James is the character like who we're like kind of more fully introduced to. I know we have like a shot of him like in yeah. 
season one. Season one. But James is the character that we meet in season two, who I think is like the most char- well characterized. Yeah. And like this kills me to say because I love Sahar. But, like James, I think he like really like they really did a good job with him. And like obviously they had to mm-hmm. because they were developing this this love interest with like Isaac and you know, you have to do some extra work for that to make sense. Um but they do a good job of of like introducing him to us mm-hmm. and making us fall in love with him, which I think is important because that makes it all the more powerful that Isaac just isn't getting yeah. the warm and fuzzies that everyone thinks he should be getting. Mm-hmm. So I think this early work is really important for what Isaac's story be- kind of unfolds into. Um, so well done, Alice, because James is a character that we had in the comics, but like barely. Yeah. And I think that they've been developed really, really well into a potential love interest for Isaac. Mm-hmm. I agree. So then it cuts to Nick telling Charlie that he can come out to some of the rugby boys at the party so that they can just leave if it goes badly. Mm-hmm. And Charlie is smiling, but to me it reads as like pretty anxious. Like he's not sure it's a, it's a good idea, but he doesn't really want to say that to Nick yet. The f- I remember the first time I watched this, I was like, that sounds like a terrible idea. Yeah. And I'm right. Um, <laughs> so, good. Uh, so then we have uh, Mr. Jai being like okay everybody let's settle down and no one's paying attention <laughs> and mr farouk's great <laughs> yes and l and then <laughs> l's face she is like offended that he yelled she turns around and looks yeah. at him like how excuse you but but first i go he was sunshine i was yes <laughs> yes <laughs> perfect for them yeah also, I've been both of those teachers, <laughs> like in different <laughs> situations. I've been the one like, all right, guys, let's bring it back. And I've also been the, all right, shut up. Yeah. <laughs> so Mr. Jai is like, thank you. And he says he hopes everyone's excited for their Parisian adventure. And there's a bunch of cheers. <laughs> and then he tells them to get into pairs of four, which will be the rooms, uh, which will be the group that they room with. And then he says, and we need to inform you all that girls and boys will not be able to room together. And everyone at the gay table is like, <laughs> Oh, no. <laughs> the teachers are like, yeah, we know. It's terrible. It's terrible, isn't it? And then my heart breaks because everybody splits up and Imogen is just left standing there by herself, looking around and looking very sad and very anxious. And it's <sighs> I hate that she hasn't been more warmly welcomed into the group because they all had a good time at the sleepover. Mm -hmm. Like, why? I mean, I know it's because of Ben. Like, I know it's because she's sitting with Ben. Like, if she wasn't with Ben, she would be sitting at the table with them and she would be getting closer. But, like, it also, she still would have been, it still would have been, it would have been like the odd one out because Sahar, L, Tara, Darcy, that's a group of four. And there's no other girls in that group for her to room with. I know. I just wish that, like, we could have seen her, like, approaching them or something, you know. Because she doesn't know that yeah. Sahar's rooming with them. That's true. And you know Tara would have, like, jumped to it and been like, well, let's figure out, yeah. okay, so, like, maybe, you know. Yeah, here's another nice girl that I know. Maybe you two should meet and room together. You know, like, Tara would have mm-hmm. definitely helped. Yeah. Tara would have, like, cracked open a spreadsheet if she had to and, yes. like, organized every single girl on this trip who's rooming with who she already has that she would have been like wait hang on a second i've got this spreadsheet ready yeah (laughs) so and then the meeting's over um before we go outside which i'm very excited for mr ajai is like that was fairly painless and i would like to do a dramatic interpretation of mr farouk's (laughs) response (laughs) (laughs) just like a lip trill like and I was just like, I am a Mr. Farouk son with Mr. Ajay rising. It just <laughs> arrived to me. Um, um, I love that. <laughs> their child. I am their child. That's that's kind of what I've come to. I would definitely be Farouk, but I also don't work with children for a reason. <laughs> so 
<laughs> but so then the group kind of like stumbles out together and Tara like hits the door handle pretty hard and is like, ah, and then Darcy trips a bit and Nick is like laughing at her and Charlie is kind of like, he's kind of slid over to the other side of L. L's in the middle with Isaac mm-hmm. and they're kind of giggling about something. And as soon as they step outside of the doors, they like, they stop obviously because they've seen Tao. But before we get to that, thank God they were the last of the people to come out. Like they just completely block the door. <laughs> <laughs> like mm-hmm. if, if they had been any sooner would that would people be like uh excuse me i'm trying hello. to go home like hello yeah. get out of the way i just thought that but was like fun. this group of individuals would be the last ones out it's true you're right you're right and l sees him first and she stops and then everybody else stops uh and everyone is completely stunned they all just freeze i love that Sahar is like confused because she hasn't met Tao. So Tara is like saying, That's Tao. And you can see her be like, Oh, that's Tao. Okay. (laughs) And Nick huddles up with the girls, which I think feels right to me. (laughs) (laughs) And then Isaac and Charlie are off to the other side. And they're, like, holding on to each other, like, leaning into each other, watching. Well, because they've been watching this unfold the longest. Yeah. Like... For them, they're like, oh, my God, it's happening. It's real. We've been talking about this for three years now. Yeah. Yeah. The first time we watched this together, Eddie made the point that, like, with Tao's wardrobe choice, it looked like he asked his mobster uncle for fashion (laughs) advice. (laughs) He looks like a fucking, like, mob men, like, someone, like, a mobster from a fucking, like movie i'm like but that tracks because he's trying to like be cool and to him like movie cool is what he thinks of as yeah. cool and so he's going for movie cool and i think he nails it yeah it does not work on him at all <laughs> and this is like such a bold move like mm-hmm. what a brave guy like how, you're gonna show up in front of all of your friends and do this in front of all of I'm them like, Presumably in front of the whole school because you don't know, like... Yeah, I mean, at least everybody who's going on the Paris trip. Yeah. Just bold. Very bold, (laughs) Tal. And so I was like, what the hell? And he says, um, he, like, starts the speech, right? He gives her the flowers. This is for finishing your exams. First of all, that's a lot of money in roses. Like, Tal is dropping dollars on this date. (laughs) And so he's like, I... I just wanted to tell you that I like you romantically and I was wondering if you want to go on a date with me. And she's like, you like me. He's like, well, yeah. And I was kind of wondering if you felt the same way. And Darcy's like, Darcy, duh. Uh, duh. <laughs> and everybody, Nick is like, oh, Darcy, you know, and Tara's like, Darcy, mm-hmm. stop. Like, no. But then everybody mm-hmm. just immediately resumes giggling back there. And she, she like hesitates. You can see her really like turning it over in her head. Like, is this a good idea? I can only imagine the like 7 million conflicting thoughts running through her head about all of the struggles she's had with this getting to this point, but she can't deny it. So she says, well, yeah. And then everybody is like, "Ah!" (laughs) freaks out. I love that Nick, he just yells, oh my God, <laughs> and takes off running and like Tara runs up and grabs uh, Elle and Isaac and Charlie run over to Tao and then everybody else kind of like filters in, kind of grabbing everybody. Mm-hmm. It's very cute how excited everyone is. Yeah, it's so cute. I'm just like, this is a very real thing. Yeah. And then like Tao is outside the theater. Um, he's like checking his hair with his phone. And I'm like, oh, you took some notes from Charlie. Constantly <laughs> check your hair. <laughs> this is a super, super, super cute movie theater. Yeah. Mm-hmm. With like the neon heart in the window. And then later when they're inside, there's like neon stars and like the seats are super yeah. cool. Like very cute. Mm-hmm. Very, very cute. Um, so I took a, a, I made a note. Like, when they're outside, right, when, like, there's the white shot and you see, like, the whole theater, the marquee says, like, now showing, and it says, Otor's season. And for a moment, the first time I watched it, I was like, 
is this like an art house cinema and this is like the made up name of an indie movie? I'm like that's a really stupid name for an indie movie because an auteur is um it's a, a film term for like a, a writer director who like does a lot of like the create has a lot of creative control. So like a couple of examples like Steven Spielberg, Martin Scorsese, Wes Anderson. Um, there's like a bunch of like th- those are kind of the ones that are coming to my mind. Uh, uh, John Francis Coppola, like those are kind of like examples of like yeah. filmmakers who I would call auteurs. It went and so I was like, this is weird. And then when he goes and says he's got two tickets to Moonrise Kingdom, I was like, oh, they're doing like screenings of like they're probably doing like all of Wes Anderson's movies all of yeah like they're probably doing like screenings of a bunch of different like movies by like auteur filmmakers so which I think is really cool and I want a theater yeah. near me to do that yeah I want to go sit and fucking marathon Steven Spielberg's uh filmography in a movie theater yeah that'd be fun mm-hmm. this is where I noticed so like We see the outfit when he asks her out, but Mm -hmm. it's kind of like, it looks like it's raining behind them and they're like under the awning and here he's like out and the light is kind of like on the front of his body and you can see that Mm -hmm. the pants are, they have like a, like a wood grain pattern to them. Yeah. And I was like, Mm -hmm. I don't know what this outfit is, but I do kind of dig these pants. (laughs) I'm kind of into the pants. And the shirt has like a bandana pattern on it. (laughs) I'm not sure how I feel about the two of them paired together. I am not a fan of mixing patterns. I tend to go with a print and a solid. But, you know, I am also not Gen Z. And Tao is very That's true. Gen Z. That's so true. Yeah, Like, he had a bucket hat and a crossbody fanny pack <laughs> in season one. That's true. <laughs> um, but he's standing there. He's, like, trying to look cool and i'm like bud she already likes you she already likes you Mm -hmm. just be yourself and then she walks up looking gorgeous as usual i Mm -hmm. love her jacket with the like sparkle shoulders love it yeah um and then i just want to point out that they say shall we go inside or whatever and they hold hands and they walk inside i didn't note that i did however note that they're like standing on either side of like the neon heart Mm -hmm. and it's like super cute but it's also super awkward And before we cut to this scene of everybody entering the party, I want to talk a little bit about a scene we didn't get that we got some stills from Mm. that was cut. And it was a scene before the party of Nick and David in their backyard. And David is talking to Nick about making sure he sees Stefan in Paris. Or is he going to see Stefan in Paris? Um, Mm. And in the shots, in both shots we got, Nick is laying down and David is standing above him. And so Mm. that already screams aggressive to me. And we Mm -hmm. already know that it's fucking David Nelson, so extra aggressive. I can only imagine it ended in an argument. Mm -hmm. And I think that that is something that is playing a factor into Nick's mood the rest of the episode and his headache Mm -hmm. and everything that he's dealing with. I think this was a potentially pivotal scene that maybe got cut. Yeah. But so I just wanted to point that out before we get to this scene where they're all walking into the party that we should have had that scene before this. So, but I'm also kind of glad we didn't because this episode makes me nauseous as it currently stands. Yeah. And also just like less David is good. Mm -hmm. So before we get to this party in the woods, I would like, the record to reflect that I don't have a frame of reference for this because I never went to any woods party. I never went to any parties in high school. I was a loser. (laughs) I I went to some parties, but they were not like this. They were much smaller. (laughs) Yeah. I have to imagine that any fires were more contained and not. I mean, we definitely have done this. At my house, uh-huh. at my parents' house, and it, like yeah. had parties with like all our friends would come over and stuff. But there were adults there supervised. I was gonna say you were supervised yeah. when you were making big fire, exactly. And, and we were <laughs> not drinking, so 
Yeah, this sounds like a fucking recipe for disaster. But that being said, Isaac walks up, looks around, and says, this definitely isn't legal, is it? <laughs> I'm like, Isaac, you are me. I love you That's also, so much. Before we get too far in, this is when I noticed it when he said that. He has, like, 20 pages of this book left. Did he bring a backup book? What's your plan here, bud? <laughs> is this your escape route? Are you going to, like, oh. I finished my book. I'm got to go home. <laughs> like what? What's the plan here? If I'm Isaac, that's 100% what's happening. I like to believe it is. My note actually says that that's what I like to believe, but then he got so enthralled with like talking with James that he doesn't actually leave. Um, mm-hmm. but I'm like it's unlike him to show up to something like this with 20 pages straight cuz he's going to yeah. that's 5 minutes. Like that book is not lasting. <laughs> yeah. Um, everybody looks phenomenal. Yes. Also, like, as someone who brought a book to the only music festival that I've ever been to, it was, like, a one-day thing, um, I also would be the person to bring a book to a Woods Bonfire party. Yeah. (laughs) And I also would use, I finished my book, as a reason to leave. (laughs) So, yes, everyone looks amazing. Uh, we get some Tori, who was... Like, really woefully not in the next few episodes. So I'm very happy mm-hmm. with her presence. I love her jumper. I need it. It's great. So um, Tara is stressed and, like, glued to her phone. And she is clearly texting Darcy. She looks around and she's like, Darcy's not answering my text messages. I'm going to go find her. So she takes off. Mm-hmm. One out. And then immediately after that, um, James runs up. <laughs> to collect Isaac. I love, I love this scene. It's what I think this might be like my favorite James scene. He's like, mm-hmm. did you want a drink? Not alcohol. I mean, there is alcohol if you want it, but if you don't, that's cool too. And he's just like, <laughs> stands there like, uh, and Isaac is like, yeah, okay. And he like grabs his hand and he takes off running. And I love Isaac being like, we're running and James is like, yes. And just like, keeps going. <laughs> it's so cute. That's precious. And so then, then it's just Tori, Charlie and Nick. So Tori says, look after him or you die. I love it. <laughs> Which is a very Tori thing to say. And I love it. And Nick is, it like takes Nick's already nervous and amplifies it. 100%. So I, I think it's funny when Tori says that line, you at first Nick turns around from looking at Isaac for yeah okay wait first of all the way that Nick and Charlie like smirk and watch Isaac and James run away is like really cute I just love how invested everyone is and <laughs> like in the friend group and then like being happy mm-hmm. and finding someone um I mean we know it doesn't go that way but like just they're they're like super supportive and excited about this development for Isaac and um <laughs> Nick, like, turns around, and he starts to, like, smirk, thinking, ha-ha, it's a joke. Mm-hmm. And then he sees her face. <laughs> yep. And she's very much not joking. And mm-hmm. then he, you can see he, like, his breath, like, hitches, and he's, like, uh... And he, like, starts to nervously look back and forth between her and Charlie. And he's, like, uh, uh, okay, okay. And Charlie's, like, Tori! Like, <laughs> can you not? <laughs> no, she, she can't not. <laughs> so then... Charlie is like, hey, are you okay? And Nick's like, yeah, I I just, I have a headache. And this is like when it starts throughout the entire party scene, there's like these moments with Nick where you see him, like he's like blinking really hard, Mm -hmm. like closing his eyes and squeezing. And like, it's very quick. Um, But Mm -hmm. I think it's all like, he's, he's getting a stress. Like his stress is making him sick, literally making him sick. Yeah. And so. And it's also making me sick yeah all of us like that's the other thing like i also like rushed through my notes on the second half of this because i didn't want to like be in this part of the episode because it makes me nauseous yeah it's not good um but charlie is also looking super stressed i i mean this is like worst case scenario environment for him if this was last yeah. year, you know? Mm-hmm. So, like, I would also be very nervous. And 
now he knows also on top of that, that Nick is planning to come out and they may have a lot of attention on them from this group of people, which is making him even more nervous and give Joe Locke awards because he conveys all that with just a look. Yep. And then we cut back to the theater with Tao and Elle and their giant snacks. I know. Okay. So I have thoughts about this movie theater setup and I've been thinking about this for a while because this is one of the stills that we got very early on. Yes. And so like they're in, it's like a comfy, like love seat mm-hmm. couch setup, which like I want because like the theaters that I go to that have like the like comfy, like recliner things, they've got an armrest in the middle and it doesn't go back all the way. So you can't like Man. cuddle. Like you can't. The ones here have two seaters where you can sit like this. No theoretically you can make them a two-seater but the armrest in the middle though it doesn't no go what? back flush and oh. so you can't really and it's really upsetting hmm. yeah they got so many concessions they each have their own giant popcorn that's the size of their torso <laughs> their own soda and nachos and candy they each have a bag of candy and candy and uh, i'm like that's so much money So much money, so much food. Like, y'all could have, like, decided to share either the nachos or the the popcorn. Because you're not going to eat all of that. Yeah. And you're going to a party after this. You're going to be so sick. (laughs) Yeah. Tao tells Elle that she uh, looks really nice, because she does. And then they have this conversation about uh, Tao's hair, which I didn't take detailed notes on. Um, But the gist of it, and I'm sure you have better notes so you can fill in the gaps... The gist of it is that Elle asks why he cut his hair. He was like, doesn't look better short. And she's like, but you like it long. I hope you didn't just do it for me. And his face goes, fuck, I fucked up. Mm -hmm. (laughs) And I think this is the moment where he's realizing, like, I am going about this the wrong way. Mm -hmm. And I cut off my hair. Yeah. But I think that also she, well, she notices immediately, right? That, Mm -hmm. like, he's being a little weird. And she kind of makes a face when we find out that they're seeing Moonrise Kingdom. She's like, you hate that movie. And he's like, but you like that movie. And she kind of makes a face. So she's kind of like coming to terms with the fact that he is doing all of this stuff for her when she just wants him to like be with her. And so both of them have this like, this is a turning point in the date and also like in their relationship. Yeah. Like, I just want to be with you and you're being a different person (laughs) right now. And he's like, I thought I was making this perfect. And now all my insecurities are creeping in and I think I'm blowing this. And so Mm -hmm. the vibe just instantly changes uh, when she says that. Mm -hmm. So then we cut to the woods and it is Sahar and Tara on a blanket. And... Tara is on the phone with Darcy. Um, Something happened and she's not coming. And Tara's saying, like, next time, just ask me. It's not a problem. Seriously, my mom can come pick you up. Like, it's fine. Mm -hmm. Um, And they hang up and Tara's like, I just don't know why she didn't ask me for a ride. And Sahar says, well, maybe she's embarrassed. And Tara says, it's Darcy. She's the the most confident person that I know. Mm -hmm. And then she remembers everything that's going on between them and her face falls. And it's just like, ugh, Corey got me with her, with her acting here. But yeah, all these little things are adding up to Tara and she's like very certain that Darcy's hiding something now. Mm -hmm. Meanwhile, we get this adorable, adorable little, um, like background conversation we can hear uh which again it's so loud we can hear it like tara and sahar are not on top of them they're like in the background and so i wrote nick just taking adorable pictures which is his duty as boyfriend i'm like you said that so loud yeah we could hear you from over there you are not being subtle. There are other people about an equidistant d- amount back from you who definitely heard that. Mm-hmm. 
Yeah, it is super, super, super cute. He says, this is my duty as a boyfriend. And Charlie's like, stop it. And he says, I'm just taking adorable pictures. You know, then they have just like a totally platonic best bro tickling match. (laughs) In front of God and the entire population of Truem and Higgs, like years 10 and up. Yeah. Okay, no, I need to. I, I It's going to explode out of me if I don't. <sighs> Here's the thing. And I know this from experience. It's going to be a lot worse. Like, there's one thing where if I'm like, yeah, we don't want to hide it anymore. That's one thing. But you need to do that alongside, like, preemptively. And that's not the right word, but it's the one I have. Telling the people closest to you and the people you care about. You don't want Cy, Christian, and Otis to find out about this through the rumor mill. It's going to make it that much harder for you to repair your friendship with them. And you want to repair your friendship with them. <sighs> it hurts me. It, it's a lot of <laughs> characters' choices in this episode make, make me physically ill. And this is one of them. Fair. So then Charlie suggests once again... Maybe we shouldn't tell them tonight. Um, And I feel like, I don't know. Nick has told Charlie over and over again that this is what he wants to do. Mm -hmm. And Charlie just continues to, like, try to talk him out of it. Mm -hmm. So, like, I mean, we don't get the line from the comics where he talks about, like, I think being fully out would destroy me right now or whatever. Mm -hmm. So, But I think that we are getting it in, like, these little moments where his anxiety is like, oh, maybe we shouldn't, maybe we shouldn't. I think that's where mm-hmm. it's all like stemming from. But also I'm getting like mixed signals from Charlie because he's like, uh, maybe we shouldn't tell him. And then he's like overly supportive, right? He's like, just think about us in Paris, like kissing and holding hands. Because we were in Paris holding hands on the Louvre and kissing the <laughs> Mona Lisa. <laughs> Uh, and it's like he's like okay let's go find them and gets up and like drags nick away and i'm like i don't do you want to tell him or not but i mean i guess that's anxiety for you Mm -hmm. (laughs) so and then we cut back to the theater it's so awkward they're both like so stiff and there's like a fucking demilitarized zone down the middle of this like sofa Mm -hmm. and he like is slowly trying to hold her hand and he's very awkward about it and then they both freeze and i'm like you literally just held hands when you came inside this theater yeah. you hold hands all the time we have seen you being extremely physical with one another i mean i get it it's different because you're on a date but like don't make it weird y'all are making it yeah. weird mm-hmm. uh i mean they already made it weird though so it's kind of like too late but yeah, and the but the and the way that it goes, like he like reaches down, he like tries to hold her hand, and like they make contact, but there's like no like fireworks, no crackles, no nothing, which I think is important and intentional. Elle like looks down, like because like she's you know responding to the stimulus of someone touching her mm-hmm. hand, and like looks over at him, and they like make eye contact. Tao looks away, looks like he's about to throw up, and like. It's just very clear that this isn't going well because Tao isn't being himself and it's throwing Elle off. And I'm like, you guys know each other. Just be your fucking selves. And and I get that like this being super awkward is meant to contrast the way that they are in Paris at the Sacré-Cœur Museum and at the Louvre. But oh my God. Yeah, this is so awkward. So awkward. And when they do finally break apart, they scoot even further away from each other than they were originally. (sighs) So then we cut back to the party and we see Nick and Charlie kind of walking up to the the crowd and we get Orla Gartland's Kiss Your Face Forever, which is at the top of my season two songs. Love it. Mm -hmm. Love it. Love it. I'm obsessed with this song. Unfortunately, this scene is not at the top of my season two scenes. Yeah. Like this sequence. I seriously feel like I'm going to throw up just thinking about it. Like it. (laughs) There's a reason that I didn't go to these fucking parties, people. I'm like, yes, some of it was that I didn't get invited to them because I was a loser. But if I got invited, I wouldn't go. 
Because I got invited to these parties in college and I didn't go because it was stressful as fuck. Mm -hmm. Carry on. So they walk up and as soon as they get close to the crowd, some people, some dudes, I don't know. Who are these people? Who are you? Why are you grabbing Charlie and pulling him away? Like, who are these people? Who are these people? (laughs) Don't touch him. I don't know. I hate it. But then Nick chooses this of all moments to be like, I need to talk to you. I think it's it. It's more of a panic response, I think, because he's yeah. like obviously panicking. Charlie's been pulled away from him. This is so chaotic. It's such a nightmare. It was their intention for them to find these three boys. Mm-hmm. But he was not expecting to have to face them, one, on his own. And B, he's like kind of in the chaos of it all. They're in the middle of a crowd. And he's like in such a panic, I think. He's just, he doesn't know what to do in this moment because mm-hmm. he doesn't. I mean, even if Harry hadn't come up, I don't think he would have been able to get the words out. He wouldn't. I don't think that he was prepared to do this without Charlie there to support him. Yeah. And he's panicking and Charlie's panicking. I would be, who are these people? <laughs> so, yeah, the rugby lads come over. Nick says, starts to say that he needs to talk to them. He's standing there kind of looking around. I think he's looking for Charlie. Then Harry comes up, throws his arm around Nick, and he's like, hey, what are you guys talking about or whatever? You know, Nick kind of just stares at him. He's like, all right, everybody shut up. Are you ready to burn some shit? And I was like, it would be Harry. Harry would be the one to like be like egging all of this on. Um, Well, his parents are the only one who could bankroll this amount of fucking like balsa wood furniture to just stack up to burn. True. True enough. Um, oh, that's what the rugby lads had said to Nick when they first show up. They're telling mm-hmm. him that he should be the one to light the fire because he's the rugby captain. Yeah. And he earned it. And he did, like doesn't hear any of it. He's just like, I have to talk to you. <laughs> like, mm-hmm. so then everyone starts chanting, fire, fire, fire. fire. And I'm like, they're being so loud. The police would definitely be notified. There's no way that this party's going under the radar with them oh, acting yeah. the way that they're acting. Mm-hmm. But it's also like such a like teen boy response. <laughs> uh-huh. It really is. Also adult men that I have been around <laughs> uh, and may or may not be married to. <laughs> Just like, <laughs> <bye>. <laughs> Uh, everyone was kind of getting it on it but you know whatever so Tao I didn't write down because again I stopped writing down he's like shitting on the movie and he's like saying it's like technically Wes Anderson's like weakest movie in terms of like the story because it all hinges on the romance between these two kids and so I will say I have failed you all (laughs) Um, I love Wes Anderson I haven't seen Moonrise Kingdom fully had the intention to watch it um in anticipation of this episode please refer to my previous uh references to i got sick um so like nothing was happening during that time because my brain was mush so i was not able to watch it as i intended but what i will say is this is not the way to act period end of sentence Like, forget on a date. Like, this is not a way that you act with friends or with other people. Like, you don't just shit on movies. I mean, have I done it? Yes. But I also acknowledge that it's a shitty thing to do. And Elle calls him on it. She's like, then why did we see it if you don't like it? And um, please correct me or fill in the blanks because I didn't write it down. But he basically is like, but I wanted to make it perfect for you. But it's it's two of you. It's a relationship. It's a partnership. It's not put Elle up on a pedestal. Because yeah, that's exactly. not healthy. <laughs> exactly. And she says, like, if we're going to go on a date, it should be something that we both like. Mm-hmm. And he kind of is like, fuck. <laughs> yeah, because he fucked up. Yeah. And then she's like, my mom should be here in like five minutes. Do you still want to go to this party? And he's like, yeah. And so then she gets, like, a very shy smile and says, thank you for asking me out. And he says, thank you for saying yes. And I'm like, okay, maybe it's going to be okay. Yeah. But. But it's not. But we go back. Tao and I'll go to the bonfire. And Naomi and Felix are here. And I put four question marks. And I'm just like, where do y'all live? 
because Lambert's like far away. And I'm like, do you do you live like near Kent? Like what's because y'all have been hanging out a bunch. And then also Tao my my other note here is Tao is upset, reverts to season one Tao, and I want to smack him. And I'm like, do I understand and have empathy and context for why you're being the way you are? Yes, still want to smack you. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. He he finally snaps um, when he sees Naomi and Felix and yeah. he just breaks and he says, you know, I don't understand where I went wrong tonight. So many ways. She's like, it's like you're being a diff- completely different person, which is true. Mm-hmm. Um, and then he's like, you're the one who's a different person. You've gone off and made new friends and abandoned me. And it's like, Tao. <laughs> Your daddy issues are showing, Tao. Yeah. And I know that you're like hurt and upset that this didn't go well, but you're not making it better by lashing out. Mm-hmm. You are making it worse because she leaves. Mm-hmm. And she goes and hangs out with her new friends and not you. Yeah. So then we get this, like, splice of the two of them because Charlie mm-hmm. walks up. Yeah. And says, Tao, how did it go? And Tao says, bad. And then we cut over to um, Felix saying, maybe he was just nervous. And then Tao says, I'm fundamentally unlikable. And Charlie says, Tao, don't say that. And then uh, Naomi says, he was probably just trying to impress you. And Elle said, I like the old Tao. And then Tao breaks my heart. And William Gao, like, kills this. Mm-hmm. He says, I try too hard and I talk too much and I ruin everything. And, like, when he says I talk too much, his face breaks. Oh, oh God. <laughs> and then Charlie says once again, Tao, please don't say that. I'm like, you're not really, like, he's not really reassuring him. He just keeps saying, please don't say that. Which I know that he's, like, caught off guard. He's also highly emotional. He's lost Nick. There's a lot going on. But I'm just like, ugh. Like, these guys, everybody just needs <sighs> big hugs from everyone. Yeah. Which Charlie and Tao do have a big hug. Mm-hmm. And Tao says he's going to go home. And we see Elle saying, I've liked him for so long, and it just hurts. I don't want to feel like this anymore. And then the three of them hug. And it's, like, very sweet. They're proving that they're here. They're going to be good friends. You know, they're here to listen and support her. Um, so I'm glad to see that they're going to be, like, meaningful good friends uh for l mm-hmm. yeah so charlie like leaves to go and find nick and nick finds tori who's in a tent sipping on some diet lemonade or something and um tori asks nick where charlie is nick says he lost charlie and tori in a very tory fashion but also it breaks my heart says you said you'd look after him not good at keeping your promises are you yeah so when he walks up, up and realizes that it's Tori. He, you can tell he's scared. Like he freezes. Um, and then when she says, you're not very good at keeping your promises, are you? We already know that this is a nerve for him. And his face falls instantly. And he looks even sicker than before. Mm-hmm. And I think that you can see her face immediately falls when she sees his face and she says like you don't look very well and that is tori speak for are you okay (laughs) like Mm -hmm. i think that you have to remember that this is just like how she is and like this was her way of like checking on him because she knew that she had struck a nerve with him when Mm -hmm. she said that and she like didn't really mean it the way that he took it Mm -hmm. um she meant it in her way. Right. It was more of like a throwaway line for her, I think. Whereas he took it very much like, this is another person I've let down. Yeah. And he almost looks like he's going to pass out for a second. Or maybe cry and also pass out. <laughs> but or vomit. He says he'll find him, he promises. Which is maybe a poor choice of words considering <laughs> the conversation he just had. Um but again, you could see it's he's putting so much pressure on himself and it's really like wearing him down. And yeah. as he walks away, Tori does look worried. Like she is concerned about him. Mm-hmm. So then we see everybody's burning shit. Isaac and James are having a conversation. We see 
Isaac kind of looking around at everybody making out all around him and then kind of like snapping back into the conversation, Mm -hmm. um, which is important to see that Isaac is starting to like pick up on how much coupliness is happening, happening Mm -hmm. around him. Including again. So also another thing I forgot to mention this book lovers is spicy. Oh yeah. Interesting. Mm -hmm. Cause that's like a, novel written for adults yeah not it's not ya so then nick kind of stumbles upon the rugby lads again and he's like starting starting to have this anxiety attack and he says hey there was something that i needed to tell you and he's still kind of like looking around for charlie and that's when he starts to kind of like dissociate and see our characters which i did write down all of do you want me to read them out Mm-hmm. Okay, so first we see Tori, mm-hmm. and she's like pissed, like foaming at the mouth. <laughs> Very yeah. well done, Jenny. Um, she says, you're bisexual, so that means you're going to cheat on my brother. And then we see Imogen, mm-hmm. and she says, are you sure you're not just gay? And then Ben says, "Ugh, it's fun, isn't it, sneaking around with him? And then David says, pick a side. And we see Charlie and he says, you promised you were going to come out. And then we hear, we hear two more, three more things. So we hear without seeing them, we're kind of seeing Nick struggling and seeing like the anxiety spiral Mm -hmm. around him. And we hear David's voice saying, I should have known you'd be gay. We hear Tori's voice saying, he's still lying for you. And then we hear Nick saying, this is exactly why I didn't want to tell you. And then that's when Harry, like, comes up, like, right before Ben's part of the anxiety attack. And it, like, puts his arm around Nick and jostles him. And he's like, tell us, go, tell us what? And then Charlie shows up to protect Nick. <laughs> I don't want to talk about any of that. I just want to throw up. <laughs> Fair. It's so well done, though. Like, it's really effective. And, like, I think, like... Including Imogen and Tori in that were really important because we as audience members know that those characters would not say those things. And so, like, it is entirely within the realm of possibility that, like, Ben and Harry and David are going to say shitty things like that. But we know that Tori, especially, like, Alice Oseman fans who've read Solitaire and, like, This Winter and know Tori, know she would never say anything like that. Mm -hmm. And we know that Imogen wouldn't say anything like that. And so it really is effective in being like, this is how bad his anxiety is that like these people who he knows and probably knows wouldn't say things like that. Like it's really, really under his skin. And this is like the first time that we really see him grappling with the by phobia of it all of like what he's worried about in terms of specifically coming out as bi and it hurts me yeah i it's one that i struggle to watch so it's a lot it's so much but yeah then charlie shows up and i love this <laughs> love <laughs> it. he shows up he pushes harry off and he says nick doesn't want to talk to you harry piss, piss off. off it's great <laughs> and i love it Harry's reaction. I think it's perfect. <laughs> like it's so perfectly spot on. Um, he just like starts giggling, thinks it's the funniest thing ever. Mm-hmm. But then he calls Ben G. That seems like such a distinctly American thing. I didn't like it. I was like, what? <laughs> no. Yeah, no. Yeah, he says like he like taps him and says, G, how funny is he? Or something like that about Charlie. Um, which is their way of getting our attention on Ben because then he starts kissing on Imogen while Nick and Charlie are looking at him on purpose. And it's gross. I put like the throw up emoji in my notes. However, Imogen looks phenomenal. Everybody looks great at this party. Yeah. And then Charlie's like, are you okay? And Nick says he's feeling really ill. And Charlie's like, I'm taking you home. And so they leave Mm -hmm. and we cut to the Nelson kitchen and Charlie is making himself a tea, Nick a tea, and Sarah a tea. Mm. And we get a Charlie and Sarah scene finally. 
And this is when she says, like, oh, I told Nick to put a hat on when he was walking Nelly today. He's just got a bit of sunstroke. And it's like, um, that's not really what's going on, Sarah. Like, maybe dig a little bit deeper. Mm -hmm. But I also think, like, she probably wants to, like, respect his privacy. And, like, like, I feel like they probably will have a conversation after he's feeling a bit better. Yeah. Um, So... He says, you know, can I stay over or can I stay for a little while just to make sure he's okay? And she's like, yeah, of course, just not past your curfew. Don't want to get you in trouble with your mom. Um, And she says, Nick's really lucky to have you, Charlie. And it's just super sweet. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Um, So he takes the tea up to Nick's bedroom. This scene is so sweet. It kills me dead. It's so tender and loving. Mm. He climbs in bed with Nick and he's like, I brought you some tea and Nick is like, fuck the tea. I need cuddles. And so he (laughs) he like comes over and gets cuddles and he says, Char, you told Harry to piss off. But he's like half asleep. He's like, Char. Like, yeah, he's like, yeah, it's adorable. Yeah. He's got like, he's all raspy from like, you know, being Mm -hmm. asleep and stuff. And he says, I enjoyed that. (laughs) (laughs) And Charlie says, so did I. I'd do it again. And so Nick kind of sits up so he can look at him eye to eye. And he says, yeah. And he says, I'd fight them. And he says, you'd fight? And he said, I'd fight anyone who's mean to you. And I (laughs) saw. I can't handle it. Can't. It's not okay. I'm not okay. (sighs) And that breaks Nick. And he starts apologizing. And Charlie's like, for what? And he says, I I said I'd tell him and I didn't. And Charlie's like, Nick, it's okay. And he's like, but I promised. And that's when it clicks for Charlie that there's like something deeper. He's like, what do you mean you promised? Mm-hmm. And he tells him like that day at the beach, I said I'd come out and and I, and I haven't. And he's really feeling like every single day he doesn't come out, he's letting Charlie down. Mm -hmm. And I think he really needed to hear this from Charlie. Yeah. Uh And he tells him like, listen, there's this idea that when you're not straight, you have to immediately tell all your friends and family, like you owe it to them. um, But you don't. And this is so, 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 so true. And sometimes people get offended when you do finally tell them and they're like, you could have come to me sooner. Like, why did you hide it from me? And it's like, it's not about you. It's not about you. It's about me <laughs> and my journey. So I think it's important that he heard this. Um, and then Charlie suggests that maybe they should forget the coming out plan for a little while. And Nick sits up, sits up in the way that he says, really? Like with his face, I mean his face, with his voice like very soft and breathy and like, it's like hopeful, right? It's like, can we, can we just Mm -hmm. drop this for a bit? Um, And Charlie's like, yes, you know, and he says like, let's just stay low key in Paris and then it'll be the summer holidays and we can just be us. And Nick says, that does sound nice. And then I have a side note. (laughs) I do not think they were very successful in in the slightest at keeping it low key in Paris. But anyway, this is a very mature and caring Mm -hmm. response from Charlie. And I also kind of looking and thinking ahead to Paris, I think that having the permission to not come out yet lets Nick feel more comfortable with coming out. Yes, it removes that pressure. Yes, whether or not they succeeded at being low-key before Nick makes the decision to come out at Tara's party, this definitely, it took the pressure off, which then made it, easier for him and i also think like the lower stakes of like the people like it's not like his best friends like Cy christian and notice are yeah i agree it, it totally removes some of the pressure for him and he's like mm-hmm. you can already tell in the next episode that he's less stressed like, yeah just just mm-hmm. by looking at him but yeah this is very self-aware and mm-hmm. like mature yeah Uh, For Charlie to be able to, like, see what's going on with Nick and to, like, pull back on the one thing he wants more than anything else Mm -hmm. in order to uh, remove some of this stress um, from Nick. Which, obviously, we know he'll do because he just wants everything to be perfect Mm -hmm. for Nick anyway. But, like, I don't know, a 15-year-old 
<laughs> like yeah, this is like big. And also for him to like do that and still name like the feeling he's having of like I want you to come out on your own terms. But also there's this part of me that wants everyone to know. I love the way he frames it of like part of me wants everyone to know you're my boyfriend. Of like it's this thing of like he's happy and he's proud of Nick and he wants everyone to know that, which like is totally relatable. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But during this little speech um that Charlie's giving, Nick falls asleep. So he doesn't hear the important bits of Charlie saying that sometimes he does just want people to know. Oh, but little buddy was so exhausted and you know, he's sleeping so good too. Mm -hmm. And Charlie kisses his head and then looks off into the distance and takes some breaths. And while this is happening, love song by Biba Doobie started playing. Yeah. And y'all know, I love me a Biba Doobie song. Mm -hmm. I love that song. And it just, like, with everything else in the episode, to, like, end on this just, like, soft, tender moment and this soft, tender song, just am unwell. Yes, and it just fades to black. <laughs> <laughs> it's painful. It's This is a very painful one. It's a, yeah, yeah, that's, that's definitely, yeah. So what was your favorite quote? <laughs> <laughs> Um, it's on the lighter side. It's, it's Tori, look after him or you die. It's That's also what I wrote. I was like, I'm gonna, we just need some like levity and some fluff at the end. I'm going to make it a funny one. I'm not going to make it like a heavy one. Yeah. I just need some, I just need yeah. some light and I need some Tori spring in my life. And, and also as an older sister, relatable. Yeah. <laughs> mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So, uh. <laughs> How's this one on your heart stopper scale? It's probably going to surprise you. Probably not. Tell me. I'm. It's still going to get a four for me. Okay. Because uh, specifically the really good mate scene, the equipment room scene, all of the Tau and L stuff before it takes a turn, uh -huh. like him asking her out, them saying yes, all being all adorable. It's finally happening. It really gets my heart going, you know? So I think this episode overall is very, very sad. But yeah, those moments are so strong for me that it, I'm still going to give it a four. Yeah. Uh, yeah, no, heart stopper for me, 3.5. So pretty much same. I just, the towel stuff, even the like asking her out scene, it just, cause, because he's like so like out of el his element, it didn't quite do it for me um, in the way that later towel stuff does. Um, but the Nick and Charlie stuff, really good mates the equipment shed and this conversation at the end like still get me heartbreaker scale 1100 million thousand yes yeah i'm, <laughs> I'm dead dead yeah it's it's a tough one. i'm like we knew this season was gonna be yep rough compared to season one and like i'm gonna be honest like having read the comics like i even recommending season one to people and being like, it's so like light and fluffy and happy. I just like, I always had this trepidation about like recommending it to people for like the light and happy stuff because I'm like, but it's about to take such a turn. Yeah, I know. Like this makes me genuinely afraid for season three. Oh, I'm terrified. <laughs> I am terrified for season three. Yeah. And, like, it's already starting. Like, people are already making edits of, like, Nick at the desk by himself. And I'm like, stop, stop, stop. We're not there yet. Please stop. So I think that just about wraps us up for today. Because <laughs> uh, Alyssa has died. And, of course, this is a bi-weekly podcast by two bisexuals. And we will be back in two weeks for a much happier very special bonus episode i am so excited it's been a long time coming it's been in the works for a while it's already been recorded so it will be out soon and mm -hmm. <laughs> on time if you want to follow us online you can find us at why are we cast on all platforms and until next time bye bye